Welcome to the Healing Broken Families podcast, where I host conversations on divorce, parental alienation, and high conflict personalities. I am so excited to be in conversation today with Dr. Caleb Jacobson, who is a sex therapist and a Bible scholar. He is an internationally recognized expert on the topic of human sexuality. He is also the host of the Sex Therapy Podcast. And so welcome. Welcome, Dr. Caleb. It's so good to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. Well, welcome. I think I'm going to learn a lot and I hope our audience does too. And we're going to just take a deep dive here, a plummet, uh, a glorious dive into a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff. Well, let's do it. I'm excited. <laughs> Okay, I want to start off uh, with the who, what, where, when, and why, because that's that's kind of how I orientate in my little brain. So um, I know who you are, um, but I'm very confused because you say you're a sex therapist. In fact, you are a sex therapist and a Bible scholar. And as a coach, I'm always trying to figure out how things come into alignment. Yeah. And so let's start there. And I'm sure everyone does start there. But let's start with like the that would be like the what. So I'm like the one person who does this, right? Like I, I, I don't know. So I have doctorates in both areas. I don't know anybody else who does. Uh, like I know, I know sex therapists who are religious, and I know religious people who like to have sex, but I don't know any of them that that have have done both areas. So it's actually when I was going to college, I wanted to study Bible. Like I was, oh, I was so excited. I wanted to study Bible, and my parents thought what are you going to do with a Bible degree? Like there's like, you really like, it was something I was interested in, but they weren't really too excited about this. And so they are like, you know, you could study Bible, but you need to do it as a minor study something else where you can at least get a job one day. Like, you know, if you're paying all this money for college, you need to be able to work. So <laughs> I, I didn't know what I wanted to major in. I finally decided to do psychology. Um, and I was going to major in religion. And I thought that when it was over with, I would then be able to make up my mind which direction I wanted to go into. Uh, turns out I ended up taking every elective class I could in really, because I was so fascinated by the subject. Like it was so, so much fun for me. And so I ended up with two bachelor degrees in a, like a three and a half year time period. And so, and I got scholarships in both theology and in, and in psychology. So I, I had to really kind of decide what I was going to do, and I couldn't make up my mind. So I just kind of did them all both until it, we ended up here, which worked out really well. I guess the more confusing part was how we got into the sex area. Uh, and that started when I was in my first internship with the Army Substance Abuse Program. And, you know, sexuality and substance abuse really go, there's a lot that goes on between the two, whether it is sexual abuse or, you know, some people make very poor judgments about their sexual uh, lifestyle or sexual behavior that they often regret afterwards, whatever the case may be. There's a connection between sex and substance abuse. So I was doing substance abuse and I had all of these young soldiers, I say young, they were probably around my age, like, or maybe younger and at the time, and they were coming to me asking me all these questions about sex. I had no idea what the hell they were talking about. Like, they were telling me about stuff they would do on the weekends. And I, you know, I didn't even know what, I had no idea what, the, like, didn't know what they were doing. Like, had no idea. And I thought, I really need to, I need to look into this a little bit. Like, I need to be able to study up on this. And my mother, she was working at a hospital a uh, psych hospital, and she had received her certification as a forensic specialist. So for women or men who were victims of sexual violence, this is what she was working on. So I began to understand that sexuality really played a big part in who we are as people and our overall experience in life. So I, in my master's program, I knew I wanted to work towards sex therapy when I when I was in my going towards my doctorate. So that's what I did on that area. And then with the religion part, as I was in Hebrew Bible and biblical archaeology, I got involved in like sex, sexuality and gender studies with the Bible and in archaeology. And so they all intertwine. 
Okay, and we're that's this is good, and we're going to unpack a lot today in this episode. I know we're going to connect all of the dots. Personally, when I think of the Bible or Christianity, I think of like called to be a servant leader, and, and you know, I think of love, healing, peace. Those are just some of my uh, feelings about the Bible. So obviously, you felt a calling to be a sex therapist. Would that be accurate, Dr. Caleb? Yeah, so in Judaism, there's a principle known as tikkun olam, which means the repairing of the world. And the idea here is that when God, it, and this is Kabbalistic, so this is really mysticism. This isn't in the Hebrew Bible. It's, it's, it, but it's, mysticism teaches that when God created the world, he cracked it. And the purpose that it is our responsibility to to work towards repairing the world we live in to make it a better place, okay? And so I would say that as, a, as an Orthodox Jew, uh, that principle is, is very important to me and it relates a lot to having compassion and, and caring about people and the world that we live in and trying to make that a better place. And I cannot think, going back biblically, I cannot think of anything better then repairing relationships, repairing people's perception of their selves, and preparing uh, and repairing families. So I, I think it's essential. That's beautiful, and and I would agree with you. Later in this episode, I'm going to ask you about trauma, sexual addiction, pornography, and things like that. But um, I think, yeah, I think you know. Sometimes I wake up and I go, "What's this day going to bring?" And today I thought. Whoa, why am I interviewing a sex therapist, Mr. You know, and I questioned myself and I was a little bit like, just, I questioned myself like, is, but, and I was pretty scared to talk to you, to be honest, but I, I remember that I felt intuitively guided to um, hold the space together with you today, because I think that we're all sexual beings. And what I've noticed is that we, there's a lot of call for healing around sexuality. So um, where would be the next best place to take this talk, uh, doctor? Well, I, I'll first say that I, I, I agree with you that we are, sexuality is at our very core of our existence, okay? It's how we think about ourselves when it comes to sex, sexuality, and gender. Like, it's how we relate to our bodies. Mm -hmm. It's how we relate to the world around us. It's how we relate to others. It is at the very core of our experience as humans. Mm -hmm. And not only that, I will take it a step further and say that it's at the very core and dependability of the survival of our species, okay? So as we continue as a, as a civilization, as humanity, sex, sexuality, and gender has such a major role there. What's unfortunate is that in the world that we live in, our society has placed such a disconnect between people and their sexuality. And when I'm saying sexuality, I'm not talking sexual behavior, although that's part of it. There's so much more to sexuality than just what they do in the bedroom or anywhere else in the house or wherever they like to have fun. It's, it's so much more than that. And when we are, I always say when we're sexually aligned, we're not easily contained. In other words, people who are sexually aligned have much more self-confidence. Their relationships are a lot more intact. And I'm not even talking sexual relationships. I'm talking about your relationship with your family, with your friends, with, with your general surrounding in the world that you live in. Um, I, I, I recently had a conversation with someone, uh, the, a sex worker was interviewing me, which was kind of fun. And they were asking me questions and they were telling me a story of someone they knew who had, had sadly died. And this person, they were really worried that when their family went to this person's house and saw what this person was into sexually, how their family would respond. And I told this, I said, you know, one of the most liberating things in the entire world, for me anyways, is I know because of the work that I do, if 
if I died tomorrow and my family came to my office or to the house and they saw like there would be no shame, no guilt, no surprise. Do you understand? Like, because they understand the work that I do. They understand the person that I am because I'm very free and open in that. And there's such liberation in that to where you can actually live authentically. Again, I'm not talking about sexual, what, what you're doing sexually. I'm not talking about what you prefer to do sexually. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm saying that when you are aligned with your sexuality, your sexual preferences, your sexual orientations, who you are as a sexual being, you don't have to fulfill certain uh, gender stereotypes in the world, you know, uh, where, where we're taught a guy has to act this way, a woman has to act this way, or whatever the case may be, you can live and be the person that, that, that you're created to be. And I'll tell you, and maybe this is a little too spiritual for your listeners, but I often say, and there's a principle in Judaism as well, that we are all created in the image of God. And I know Christians believe that as well. And I often tell people that, that that doesn't mean that we look like God. It means we are a reflection of a certain part of God's being in essence. And when we try to conform to any other standard and we're not living authentically, we are actually hiding the image of God because we're not letting that image of God shine forth in the world we live in. And to me, that's very sad. Yeah, I, I, I was really resonating what you're saying to me because... Um to be our authentic selves is so liberating. And that's where we really connect deeply with our personal power, right? Would you agree? 100%, 100%. And that's really where we find happiness, right? Mm -hmm. And that's really where, you know, if we're talking about relationships, when you are authentic and you are fully open with that partner, you're able to connect in a way. Everybody's been in a relationship where they, early on, they might say something like, um, you know, I really like them, but I don't feel like they're opening up to me. Or I, I feel like they're still kind of closed off. And there's different reasons why people are closed off. It could be trauma they've experienced. It could be um, uh, it could be past hurts or it could be uh, self-esteem issues, whatever the case may be. But this goes all, all of that affects our authenticity as people. And when we're able to be authentic, we can connect with people in a very warm and comforting and beautiful way that we that 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 we cannot be paralleled any other way. I agree. Um, like obviously, I talk a lot about um, divorce and broken relationships on this show, and you've just outlined all of these beautiful benefits of having a balanced and aligned. Uh, sexual relationship or with yourself with others intimacy but yet so so much of it out there is um out of out of whack or out of balance and uh like why is like why is that like why you know like for example couples often get divorced if their sex life isn't fulfilling or if there's affairs in the marriage um how can couples get into the mode of having a good sex life if it's unfulfilling or you know not serving them how much time do you have <laughs> um, <laughs> every question is going to be a loaded question okay doctor. <laughs> because there's there's so much there in what you just said okay so let's there's so much there to even unpack okay mm -hmm. so when we when we say a couple is not having a fulfilling sex life I often ask them, what does that mean? Okay, when clients come in, and now there are issues where the couple may have something known as mismatched desire, where one partner wants to have sex more than the other partner. Uh, it may surprise many of your listeners that usually it's the female partner who wants to have sex more than the male partner, which goes against every stereotype that we're taught, right? So let's take that stere let's take this example, because if you're a man, and you're coming to therapy and you are the one who isn't having the desire and your female partner wants to have sex more than you do. So now not only are you like, okay, I'm having to deal with this relationship conflict, but I'm also having to deal with this internal conflict is what's wrong with me that I don't want to have sex all the time. Mm -hmm. Like something has to be wrong with me. What's going on. Right? So now we have, 
we multiple issues that are going on, which if he thinks something's wrong with him, obviously that's going to affect his sex drive as well. He's not, he's like, well, something's wrong with me. I definitely don't want to have sex. Now I don't, it's a, it's a, it's a cycle. It's a vicious cycle. So that's like one example. Another example you mentioned is infidelity in a relationship and what infidelity does to a relationship. Now I know a lot of people and what's very popular now is polyamory. And I'm going to say this on your show. It's going to get me in trouble, but I'm going to say it anyways. Okay. My experience in working with couples who are in polyamorous relationships, they love to talk about the fact that they have more communication than couples who are in monogamous relationships. But the truth of the matter is, in every situation, the issues that I've had to work with, with polyamorous couples, revolve around the same issue of jealousy. And that, that is exactly what we're talking about when we are talking about infidelity and that broken trust that is there. And you cannot have broken trust or jealousy in your relationship and have a healthy and fulfilling relationship because there's always going to be something there that kind of becomes a struggle for the partners. Either it's in, in both situations, it's either the one partner is accusing the other partner of cheating or even if they are or not, or even if they've had done it in the past or not. So one partner is always on the defensive and the other one always thinks they're a private investigator. And you, so, so the partner who's on the defensive, not only are they like being accused of things all the time, but now they're having to watch what they say, what they do. And so it goes back to, they cannot be authentic in front of their partners because they have to keep their guard up. And that creates a wedge in the relationship. So, so going back, <laughs> go ahead. Sorry. Doctor, at the end of the day, it really does come down to like intimacy. It's about really intimacy and trust. Yeah. 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 And when you say intimacy there, of course, we're not just talking about, you know, penal to vaginal intercourse. We are talking about a connection between couples that is both physical and emotional. Right. right. Um, we're talking a very deep connection among couples. That's what I I really try to elevate my couples to reach a level where they can be vulnerable and and connected in those in those both of those areas. So the question is, you know, what are we doing about our sex lives though, right? Like that's, that's like the basic question, like how can we improve our sex life? How can we make sure that we're having sex? How can we connect this way? And in those cases, I always encourage couples to do things like schedule sex. Um, I recommend at least once a week they schedule sex. Now, for those who are listening who are like, well, that doesn't sound very sexy, like that spontaneous sex is a myth. I'm just going to tell you the idea of spontaneous sex is a myth. You say, of course it's not. When we were dating, we had spontaneous sex all over the place. And I said, oh, really? Did you? Because if, if you go back to when you were dating, before you were living together, when y'all were just meeting up and having great sex, what did you do? You knew you had a date. So what did you do? You planned for the day because you had a date. You had something scheduled. You went home. You got yourself ready. You shaved up really nice put on your nice underwear, put on your nice clothes, put on cologne or perfume, right? You prepared because you were hoping that you would have a little bit of fun that evening, right? Like this, this is what happened. So it's not really spontaneous. It is something that you planned. That is a really, really weird and powerful point that I never thought about. Because you do, you kind of have like a preconceived expectation and you're, you sort of get ready for it all day in, in one way or another. So Absolutely. you're telling couples to set their iPhone and, and make kind of a little appointment. I say at least once a week. I think it's very important for couples to do this. And for the men who are listening, um, what I think is very important, if you are in a heterosexual relationship, if you have a female partner, do not, I know when it's over, say you're tired, be, and that's normal because of you know how our physiology work as men. So most men are very tired after sex, which is okay because they're so relaxed. That's one of the benefits of sex. Better sleep is also a benefit of sex. But do not negate cuddling with your partner afterwards because this begins her sexual response cycle all over again. 
So it is building things up to the next encounter. You know, we have we have such a lack of sexual education in our world. It's actually yeah. appalling. I hate to say that many youth even learn about and men learn about sex through pornography. I'm not trying to change the subject because right now I'd like to sort of keep going with what you're saying and ask you what values do does one need to have to be a good lover? You just mentioned cuddling. Well, so I, I would say that, and I want to touch on the pornography part, especially since you brought up the topic of values, okay? And first off, I think that the values to be a good lover really revolve around being conscious and aware of your partner's needs. And this really, while while it may fall on one partner, you say, oh, that's a lot of work to be conscious of my partner, but it's really a group effort because communication is essential here, right? I tell couples and individuals all the time that you need to be able to communicate with your partner what it is that you want sexually, what feels good sexually, what you like sexually, and the only way you can communicate this is if you know what you like sexually and what you want sexually. You cannot expect your partner to have osmosis and have telepathy and automatically know what it is you like, what feels good and all of that. And you know, would you be surprised, Barbara, if I told you that most couples, when they come into therapy and I ask one of them, well, what, they, they're complaining, oh, our sex life is bad, it's gotten really boring. But, and I say, well, what do you want sexually? And they go, well, I want to have fun. Well, what does that mean? Well, I want it to be better than what it is. Well, what is better than it is, right? They've never taken the time to really thought about it. They just expect it to go phenomenal. And I tell the, cause, cause, because we live in a society today that a lot of couples, and you mentioned this earlier, if the sex is bad, let's end the relationship, let's move on to the next partner, right? especially early on before they're married or whatever the case may be. Well, the sex was bad. I like him. I like him. He was funny. He, we had a good time together, but the sex was bad. I'm going to find another guy. Or she was great. Like she was so smart. We connected intellectually. She's gorgeous. All this, stuff, but the sex was bad. Okay. You can learn to be a good lover. Sexual skills can be developed, but those personality traits and those character traits and that emotional and intellectual compatibility it's not something that's easy to be found. Mm -hmm. So we tell people to compromise in all other areas of a relationship, right? Well, they might not be the best looking or they might not have the best job, but they're good every other way. So we compromise. But for some reason we say we cannot compromise on sex. This is craziness. Like sex, if you can have the emotional compatibility, that's something we cannot teach people. Right. We can teach people to be better lovers. You're bringing so many insights to the table, like new ways to think about it. Yeah, absolutely. If you, I, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> so you also say, doctor, I love calling you doctor, that sex is not a dirty word. Yeah. Um, so how can we talk more about sex without getting embarrassed? And uh, you were talking about expressing our needs in the bedroom. Like, do you think... What would you say to someone who couldn't express their needs in the bedroom? Like, I want this, I like this. Cause I, I, I suspect, and I could be wrong, but that a lot of humans, women, I would say can't do that. Is that immature or what's that about doctor? <laughs> so, so again, you're giving me a lot, right? And we still haven't even touched on the pornography part. So I know we're getting to pornography. <laughs> I'm a lot to handle. <laughs> no, it's okay. So let's get to this question. What is something? One of the things is the way that we say sex, and and I'm not I'm not pointing you out, but hey. when when most people when most people say sex, they go oh when we talk about sex, they rush through this word, right? They 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 go through it quickly, or either they whisper it kind of low. They don't want other people to hear them using the word sex, right? I want you to say it with enthusiasm, okay? When we talk about sex. I want you to be enthusiastic when you say it because it's something that's wonderful. You know, the, I, I hear people say all the time, you know, uh, it's uh, a lot of people like to say all of this shame and guilt around it or inability to talk about it has to do with religion. I say that's hogwash because the first commandment God ever gave in the Bible was for man and woman to have sex. That's the first commandment. 
was for them to have sex, okay? So God wants us to have sex. We're created as sexual beings, all right? So, so why do we need to be ashamed of the way that we were created? This is garbage. This is absolute garbage. So, so doctor, I just want to interject. Is this societal programming then? So again, I think this goes back to what I said earlier about when we're sexually aligned, we're not easily contained. If you want to control people, you need to control their sexuality. Because it's that can, clear. Right. And that's like a little secret, a little secret actually that artists know is that there's yeah. there's power in our sexuality. So what you're saying now is having it, it's taking on more meaning for me. That's very, this is really esoteric, unknown stuff that you're sharing with us. Yeah, and 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 there's and really you're right. There is so much power in it. Like if people, I don't like to use the word, but if people would embody the message that I'm giving them today, I'm telling you it will, it will not only help them individually by increasing their self-esteem. And so many people have poor self-esteem, and this this is one reason why people cannot express what they want sexually. They don't feel comfortable. They feel embarrassed. They feel ashamed. Oh. I cannot tell you the number of even married couples have been married for, for 15, 20 years. They cannot talk about sex with their partner. Sex is just something we do. It's not something we talk about. I said, well, then you're obviously not doing it either because you're not enjoying it or having fun. Like, you know, I call them out a little bit. You need to be able to express. So what to your question of what can you do if you are not at that place? And I don't expect people to listen to this episode of the podcast and then Tonight, they're like, honey, I want you to do this. I don't, I'm not expecting this. Like, I'm not expecting such results. But this is what you can do when you are being intimate with your partner. First off, you can say to your partner, honey, dart, whatever you like, whatever pet name you call them, sweetheart, <laughs> angel, whatever you call them, okay? Tell them, say, you know, I, if you haven't been having sex, or if you have been having sex, you could tell them, you know, I really miss spending some intimate time with you. Or I really enjoy the time that we share together. I want to spend more time with you intimately, where it's just the two of us so we can connect. Okay. So those are words people can usually use, right? Mm -hmm. Now, you don't know how to tell them you want to be touched here, or you like doing it this way. And a lot of times it is due to fear of rejection even from your partner you've been with, you're like, I don't want them to think that, here goes the shame part, I don't want them to think that I'm too kinky or I don't want them to think that I'm into something dirty or what if they're not into what I'm into? Like, this is the, this is what people think. Judgment. So, huh? Judgment. Judgment. Totally. So I often encourage couples, if you cannot verbalize, okay, let's start, very basic. Let's not start about kinks or fetishes or or special things you want to do. Let's start at the very basics of touch and pleasure. What feels good? Where do you like to be touched? Now, you said, I could never tell my partner this. Maybe. But when you're laying in bed and you, you, you're kissing, right, you can take your partner's hand and move it to the areas you like to be touched. Maybe it's your side. Maybe it's your thigh. Whatever it is, you can just move your partner's hand. And I will tell you, uh, for the women who are listening, if you do this to your male partner, this will arouse them even more. Like this is something they're not going to reject. They're not going to pull their hand away. They're going to say, oh, we're going to have a little bit of fun now. Let's go with it. OK. And for a female partner. I, a lot of times they are much more comfortable. Women are much more comfortable with the subtlety of this than necessarily the man being very aggressive and dominating in what he wants. So I think it works well for both partners. So that would be the first step. Very valuable, very valuable information. Um, that, I was going to ask you, a cheeky question like what would you say to to men or just in general if like about men who can't fulfill their their women's needs i guess we kind of covered that but it's worth no covering. you know <laughs> so, I will, so, so, so i will tell you in judaism when we get when we get married the man gives his wife 
a marriage contract. It's called a ketubah. And in this ketubah, the man is promising the woman several things. She doesn't promise him anything. He's promising her something. He's saying, basically, he's saying, I'm going to feed you, I'm going to clothe you, and I'm going to give you sexual fulfillment. And there's so much material in the Talmud of what this means about sexual fulfillment and how often and uh, yada, yada, okay? So I believe, now some men might be listening, they're like, oh, I thought it was her, like my wife doesn't want to have sex, okay? Uh, my girlfriend doesn't want to have sex. Well, maybe if you focused on her needs and her fulfillment, she would be much more enjoyable because the truth of the matter is, I would tell you that most women, maybe not, so many women have not had orgasms ever because they don't orgasm through vaginal penal penetration. And most guys are so unaware and they don't pay attention to what feels good for the female partner or clitoral stimulation. They're worried about penis vagina penetration that... Why would you want to have sex if you're not enjoying it, right? Why would you want to do it if I'm doing it for him or I'm doing it because he wants it or whatever the case may be? But if you can focus on, and it's kind of what I told you earlier, if you can focus on your partner's pleasure, that's as far as values are concerned, mm -hmm. if you could focus on your partner's pleasure, your partner is much more likely to not only want to have sex more, but to start initiating sex a little bit more too. And that's a complaint a lot of people have is they always want their partners to initiate. So I would tell men, uh, there are some great books out there that they can read concerning like how to, how female anatomy works. Cause it goes back to a lack of education. Hmm. I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned earlier porn in its relation to sex education. I always say that porn might be good sex entertainment, but it's terrible sex education. Like, the woman is, you know, you're never going to find, and, and most men, when they take off their pants in the middle of the day, they're not automatically erect either, right? Women, they're not normally so turned on as soon as they bend over that that they, they're, they're already lubricated to the point where, you know, she's ready to orgasm and squirt as soon as you stick your penis in. It doesn't work this way, Okay. The other myth you see not only in, in porn, but on movies is the couples orgasming at the same time. This doesn't happen either regularly. This is, this is a myth. And if we set those as our expectations of what sex is, you're going to have very disappointing sex. So you need to understand the reality of how human bodies work. And, and to be honest with you, it's kind of nice that both couples have these differences because it really increases the time that is spent being intimate together and the ways to connect to be intimate together. And it requires you to be creative and fun and playful, which keeps that intimacy alive a lot longer in the relationship. And that, that is kind of the key to it is, is the intimacy. Right. I think that's what people are missing in society is the connection and the intimacy um, that you can't get from pornography. I kind of harp a lot on my podcast about pornography because it's quite a big issue. Um, there's like, you know, 40 million downloads a day or something like that. Uh, 200 million Americans watch pornography. So obviously that tells me people are looking to pornography for answers. Um, or entertainment. Um, but what you can't get in pornography is the, the component of intimacy, right? Yeah, so I, 40 you're very right. Americans, 40 million Americans regularly visit porn sites. That's a lot of, that's a lot of men. Well, it's a lot of women too. Do you know the number one consumer of gay porn is females? No, number I one right? Yeah, number one consumer of gay porn is women. Now, what I will say is now I will caveat this by saying that I do not watch pornography. I, and, and the reason why I told you I was at X biz all weekend, right? Like, so I'm around people in the porn industry and that is one of the reasons why I don't is because I work with a lot of people in porn and I don't, I don't, I think it's unethical for me to sexualize my clients and people that I work with. Okay. So that's one of the main caveats of why I do not watch pornography. 
there are plus and minuses when it comes to pornography. Um, we we seem to polarize porn as either being good, like we should watch it, it's wonderful, everything is great, or bad, it's an evil, it's a problem in society, we need, must do away with it. The truth of the matter is that it really is somewhere in the middle. So let, let's kind of dissect this a little bit. Okay. And, and feel free to push back at any time too, okay? Okay. I would say that for personal porn consumption, we are normally talking about porn and masturbation. Like, I don't know many people who are just sitting around watching porn just because there wasn't nothing on Netflix. Like, usually it's to fulfill personal sexual needs, right? Good point. So, so they're, they're watching porn to masturbate with. Now, you are right in the fact that there is no intimacy involved in this. But I don't believe that sexuality or sex is only for intimacy, especially when we're talking about sex with ourselves. So you are a sexual being before you meet your partner. And after you meet your partner, you're still that sexual being and you still have a sexual relationship with yourself because you're going to live with yourself every day. And statistics show that people who are married um, still masturbate. OK, now we'll talk about that subject and how that affects relationships or how that's perceived in relationships in a moment. OK, doctor. <laughs> so. So I told you, you're asking me these big questions. Like these are these are these are discussions we have to. So, with porn, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm a big advocate for masturbation. I believe masturbation does a lot. Like it helps people understand what they like sexually. It helps them to have a connection with their body. If a person has an issue like um, poor body image or low self-esteem, masturbation is really helpful in that because they realize their body can give them pleasure, so they begin to appreciate their body more. So there's a lot of benefits to masturbation, including reduction of pain. I, I headed up the menstruation initiative in 2020, which was a global study that looked at the benefits of masturbation to reduce period pain in women. We had over 20,000 participants in this globally. It helps people sleep better. It puts you in a better mood. It releases, uh, it releases hormones in your body. So, so it reduces stress. So it's very, very healthy. Masturbation is very healthy. Okay to the point where I often liken masturbation as part of a self-care routine. I think it's a part of self-care. So when someone masturbates, let's say they had a stressful day at work and they're in a bad mood, or let's say they're stressed out from the family or, or school or whatever the case may be, masturbation is a good way to relieve that stress and put them in a better mood and I would say if you are in a bad mood, it's probably a better solution than trying to be intimate with your partner. Because when you're in a bad mood, it's not necessarily the best time to try to be intimate, okay? That's true. Now, so let's say they go to pornography. Okay. There are things that porn can do that is not relative in a sexual relationship. So with porn, for example, you can skip to the part you like. You can, as soon as you are finished, you can stop the film and go on with your day, okay? So you can find what you like, you can meet your needs and move on. You don't have to worry about being vulnerable. You don't have to worry about your partner's needs or any of that. Like you could take care of your needs and, and continue on. You can't cuddle with porn afterwards. So there's still stuff missing, right? Like, mm -hmm. like so there, there's plus and benefits. You don't get the physical touch that porn gives you. Uh, and some people would say that, you know, they enjoy sex more than masturbation, even though they masturbate. Some people say this. So again, there are plus and benefits. So I would say that in that way, pornography could be beneficial to that person in helping them to elevate their mood or whatever the case may be. Now, for couples, and I'm not the biggest advocate for this, but I do know some therapists who recommend this, and I do know couples who do watch pornography together to either spice up their sex life or to fulfill fantasies that they have, 
that maybe they wouldn't want to do with their partner. Because there's some people have fantasies they don't want to live out. Like, like the idea of a threesome might be sounds good, might be fun to fantasize or think about, but it's not necessarily you want to do, right? But you can do this through porn and you can do this as a couple through porn. It could also help with arousal. So I don't think porn is all bad. Okay. Now there are some people who have, and I don't like to use addiction either. Okay. Because according to the DSM, which is a psychological manual for psychology, there is not enough research to diagnose sexual issues as an addiction. All right. And I will tell you that as a clinician and what most clinicians agree is that treating people for a sexual addiction does not work because the addiction model does not work in the treatment. So I'm, and I want to caveat that by saying, I'm not saying there's not a problem, but it's not an addiction. It could be an compulsivity. So like, if you think about like obsessive compulsive disorder, like somebody who has to keep hitting the light switch on and on and off, somebody could be like that with porn or with masturbation. Like they, they do this repeatedly, okay? It could be an out of control sexual behavior, but it is not an addiction. And that distinction is very important to me clinically because of how we treat a client. When you say addiction, people automatically go to like substance addiction, which is something that everybody who's an alcoholic will tell you they will always be an alcoholic, right? Like they're never cured of alcoholism because it's a disease. You do not have a disease if you are continuously needing to watch pornography. This is not a disease. There are things you can do to work on that situation if it is causing you distress, okay? So do, do you see the difference between that? Yeah, I think you're bringing some relevant clarifications. But there is a, there is a correlation between early trauma and sexual compulsivity. Yes. So let's talk about that, too. And I'll also talk about it um, in the reverse, because I will mm -hmm. also tell you that some people who have had sexual traumas Again, this is not necessarily what I would recommend for patients or clients, but I do know people who have had sexual traumas who also use pornography or certain kinks like BDSM as a way to take control over the trauma. So let's talk about someone who's maybe been the victim of sexual abuse or sexual violence, okay, where they lost their autonomy and their agency. Okay. However they can fantasize about it either through porn or with a partner. Mm -hmm. And in that fantasy, maybe the fantasy is similar to the violence that they had had uh, pe perpetrated upon them. Okay. But because it's a fantasy, they can take autonomy over the situation that's happening. So psychologically in their brain, it's kind of empowering to them because before they were a victim and now they are in control of this situation. That's interesting. So is it eliciting like a different somatic response? Yeah, absolutely. So, and not only that, but um, some people have, have um, testified to the fact that it has given them the ability to control PTSD um, because now they have a, they were able to change the narrative through this type of role play. And it's kind of similar. Think about this. Say someone's uh, afraid of a spider. Okay. And so if someone comes, they're like, I'm, or I'm, I'm afraid of ladders. I'm afraid of climbing up ladders. What do we do with them? We do exposure therapy. So we would say, okay, a ladder is in the room, right? Do you see the ladder? Is the ladder scary, right? I want you, then after a week or so, I want you to put your foot on the first rung of the ladder, right? So we begin to expose them to it until they see that they don't have to have this fear and this type of response anymore. 
So in some ways, this type of fantasy and, and whether it's lived out or, or through pornography has been very empowering for people who have gone through trauma. Well, I really want to honor you for bringing new insights and just, again, new ways of, of thinking about things that I'm sure many viewers maybe haven't thought about. <laughs> like very valuable. You're super knowledgeable and compassionate. In fact, I feel like I could talk to you about anything. Well, we can talk about anything. That's why I'm here. <laughs> Yay. I was just curious and we are, I was curious how long we have sex for to really make this podcast relevant. I think we need to know that doctor. So when we say sex, and I'm going to push back now because I want to say what do how do you define sex are we talking penal vaginal penetration pardon me that's what i was actually referring to yes okay so now we're talking about three to five minutes okay now so people are going i like to have sex for four hours or two hours okay first off i feel sorry for your female partner because she's going to be pretty painful. Like it's not a pleasurable experience for many women that long a period of time. It's just not. Okay. Now, if there are breaks in between and there are other things happening, that's one thing, but consistent penal vaginal penetration for that long a period is a problem. And it's a problem for the man too, because it is the, it is the diagnosis for delayed ejaculation. And there are a number of issues that could cause delayed ejaculation, whether they're physiological or psychological. I mean, wow, it's very fascinating to me. I'm learning every second we're doing this. And you know, they say never to double stack a question. But in fact, I asked you how long we have sex. And I was actually meaning like through time, because it's something we have, ah. like, you know, um, because then this would be a really valuable podcast. Like, do we have sex till we're like forever? So we talked in this episode about sex with ourselves, right? And you know, there are, there are fetal scans of fetuses masturbating in the womb, okay? So we know that self-pleasure is something that takes place through our entire lifespan, all right? Mm -hmm. it, it's a constant that we live with always. In fact, the World Health Organization, just a few years ago, they classified pleasure as a human right. So I would say that, and I encourage, I don't know how old most of the listeners are for this podcast, but I would say it doesn't matter how old you are. And, and I often hear of people, couples who come in, they say, oh, we've been married for 50 years. We're too old for that. I say, you're never too old for that, right? Now, your body might not function the same way that it did when you were 20, but that's okay too. Because we are net, like, and I'm not, I'm not saying prescription drugs or anything like that. I'm saying that in today's world with advancements in technology and, and the way that we're understanding sex of being more than just penetration, there are things that you can do that are sexually pleasurable with your partner that can be both fulfilling and enjoyable. And you can continue to explore each other's bodies and it can explore intimacy with each other, regardless of your age. Okay, thank you for that. Something to look forward to. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this, my youngest sister just finished college. And so okay. my parents are, my parents are home alone. My dad is, is he's getting close to 70. My mother's in her 60s, okay? And so she, my mother's saying, oh, your sister's going to be gone this weekend. So we're going to have the house all to ourselves. She'll be gone for a week. I said, oh, that's great. Oh, mom, this is wonderful. Y'all need to go have a nice dinner. Y'all need to come back, have some nice candlelight, a nice massage. I'll send y'all some massage oil. And y'all need to begin to reconnect and re-explore with one another one again. This is what I tell them. So I tell everybody this. It's not just... It's not just the listeners of this podcast. This is advice for everyone. <laughs> Speaking of advice, as I close each podcast, and, and unfortunately, our, our time is coming to an end, I could just chat with you forever. 
Um, I invite you to, to share your own personal truth or something that you feel you know, that our audience would like to hear, or um, I leave it to you to close it with a, you know, a healing truth or, or even a joke. It's up to you, doctor. So what, what I would say is if you have anybody who's listening to this yes. and they, maybe they've experienced sexual trauma, maybe they've experienced sexual shame as a young person or either as as they moved into adulthood and they don't feel that there's something right with them because of it. Okay. Now to me, this is, this, this, is, this hurts me when I hear people say this, because I, I look at these people when they're, when they come for therapy and you know how it is when you meet someone and you could, you could just see the type of person that they are and yet they don't recognize it themselves. So I mean, I want to encourage any person listening, whatever has happened, whether it was some type of sexual violence, whether it had to do with shame or guilt around sex, whether that was put on by society, religion, your family, it doesn't matter, whether you're struggling with sexual orientation, okay? Whether you've just been in a marriage for however long and you just think you're never going to have a good sex life. What I want to tell them is it can get better. 100%, you do not have to compromise in this area of being unfulfilled, unsatisfied, and feel like you're never going to reach a, a point in your life where you feel fulfilled sexually and, and, and fulfilled as a sexual being. You can reach that, whether it's reading books or listening to podcasts like this, or whether it's seeing a sex therapist, there are solutions available. And I want to encourage you to don't compromise in this area, but to do the work necessary to bring that change in your life. Hmm. I want to honor you and thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And um, it was wonderful, a really wonderful to receive all the powerful truths information and insights that you share today. I well, thank you so much, Barbara, for having me. It's been wonderful. I really appreciate it. I know our viewers are going to want to reach out and say hello to you. What's the best way to connect with you? So I'm all over the internet, unfortunately. I always say, follow. like, why would anybody want to be followed? Like, this is, you know, if you think <laughs> some years ago, nuts. nobody wanted to be followed. Like, this is a scary thought. Okay. But in, Instagram, so I've been, I've, I've become very active on the Instagram recently. And the, the, my Instagram is just my name, Dr. Kyle Jacobson. So they can find that anywhere. They can also tune into the Sex Therapy Podcast, which is available everywhere. And if they don't listen to podcasts, they can head over to my website. Now, this is, this is going to be hard for them to remember because it's literally sextherapypodcast.com. And if they go there now, they can get a free book called 10 Tools to Improve Your Sex Life. And they can get that absolutely free as soon as they get on the website. So they can connect anyway. Amazing. Thank you again. I encourage everyone to go and get that free download. I'm Barbara LaPointe, a divorce coach, mentor, healer, and I'm wishing everyone healing solutions in the now. Please like, comment, and share our podcast so that I can keep amazing uh, guests like you, Dr. Caleb, on our show. All the best. And until next time.